The nervous system's physiology presentation might be confusing, and some knowledge of the nervous system will be helpful. The nervous system can be divided into two parts, the central nervous system, which includes the brain and the spinal cord, and also the peripheral nervous system, which includes the cranial nerves, spinal nerves, and also the ganglion. The nerve receptors under your skin are also part of the peripheral system, and they are sensory receptors. Let's look at a quick diagram to see how the peripheral nervous system works only. Now this might be confusing, but it should be okay. Uh, we can say that the somatic sensory receptors, for example, the ones under your skin, as well as the autonomic sensory receptors, such as in your eyes and ears, after being stimulated or after detecting a stimuli, they will send signals to the central nervous system, CNS, for processing. Now, there are also different types of autonomic sensory receptors, which are inside your body, such as the enteric plexus of the GI tract. And these receptors can also send signals to the CNS for processing. These internal organ-bound sensory receptors can actually also involuntarily activate the autonomic motor neuron itself without the assistance of CNS. So the top three pictures are known as the sensory receptors, being it somatic or autonomic. They sense stimuli. The second line, which here I only drew one, is the motor part of the peripheral nervous system, PNS, which are the neurons involved in initiating a response. The motor part of the PNS of the autonomic motor neuron can then target smooth muscles, glands, endocrine cells, etc., allowing contraction or secretion of certain chemicals. And this section where the response is being carried out is called the effectors. After receiving information from the somatic or autonomic sens sensory receptors, such as the ones under your skin e or in your ears or eyes, the CNS will voluntar voluntarily or involuntarily process this information. After processing it, it can act in two ways. One, it can respond to the somatic stimulation and so send signals via the somatic motor neuron, which are voluntary neurons, that will then target skeletal muscle cells. Or two, the CNS will respond to the autonomic stimulation and so the response will be sent via the autonomic motor neuron, which are involuntary. The autonomic motor neurons will send signals down the sympathetic sympathetic or parasympathetic divisions targeting smooth muscles or cardiac muscles uh, or other glands. Now that might have been very poorly introduced. I hope you got it. Anyhow, the cells of the nervous system are basically the neurons and the neuroglial cells. I would like to concentrate on a neuron first because it's the most important. Neurons can look something like this. Uh, going over the basic anatomy, we have the dendrites, where the signals are received, the soma, where the nucleus is located, the axon, which conducts the signal towards the synaptic terminal, and at the terminal, at the very end of these fibers, are what's called the synaptic bu bulb, or synaptic knobs. Now, surrounding the neuron membrane are special glial cells, called Schwann cells, uh, and these Schwann, sh Schwann cells produce my myelin, Myelin covers segments of the membrane, providing insulation and helps with the conduction of an impulse. Between the myelin sheaths are gaps called nodes of Ranvia. The neuron soma can be easily identified because it contains a lot of ribosomes, these round things. Now the unmyelin now neurons can be also without Schwann cells, and when they are without Schwann cells, they're called unmyelinated neurons. The unmyelinated axon has a slower conduction and so sends signals much more slower, slowly. Whereas the myelinated axon, it transmits impulses much faster. Impulses always travel in a forward direction from the dendrites to the terminal end. When impulses are being sent, it usually passes through many neurons, not only one. And so this signal will be passed through. Now how the electrical signals pass from one neuron to the next is through a synapse. So here we zoom into the synapse and see here is the presynaptic uh, cell and with the impulse and the postsynaptic cell drawn here. The impulse will carry uh, the will cause vesicle vessels containing chemicals to be released. These chemicals are known as neurotransmitters, and the neurotransmitters will then bind to the postsynaptic cell, allowing the electrical signal to carry on through. That was just the basic. Uh, information. We will look into the synapse in a bit more detail later on, uh, next video or something. 
Now, there are three types of neurons. There's a multipolar, and D, A, and T uh, stands for dendrites, axon, and terminal. There's also the bipolar um, neuron, and there is a unipolar neuron with the soma in the middle. Now, multipolar neurons are the most popular and predominates over the rest. Uh, unipolar neuro neurons are mostly found in the spinal cord. So here we have a small segment of the spinal cord. Uh, here we have the unipolar neuron. It acts as a sensory neuron. It travels on the dorsal side of the spine and goes into the central nervous system where it, co where it connects to, to an interneuron, which then processes this information and then sends out a response via the motor neuron on the ventral side, the front. So neurons and neuroglial cells. Now neuroglial cells essentially help neurons. They are much smaller, but there are about three times more glial cells found in the body than there are neurons found in the body. Let's take a look at some important neuroglial cells. Now there are four. I remember them as same. Um, S is for Schwann cells and, and oligodendrocytes. A is for astrocytes. M is for microglial cells. And E is for ependymal cell. Now this will just be a brief overview about these glial cells. Um, Schwann cells are the cells we looked at before and wrap around the axon of the neuron. Like that. If we cut an axon here and look at it from a transverse view, we see here is the axon and wrapping around the axon like so is the Schwann cell. And the wrapping stuff is what the Schwann cell produces, myelin. Now myelination is important in the speed and propagation of an action potential, an impulse. Schwann cells found in the brain are referred to or known as algodendrocytes. That is the only difference. Um, next we have astrocytes. Let's just pretend we're in the brain now. And here we have the neuron. In the brain there are also many capillaries to nourish the brain. Astrocytes basically has so many appendages and attaches to anything it can find. It can attach to capillaries, neurons, neuroglial cells, other neuroglial cells, and when it attaches to it, it coats it like protection. So astrocytes provide physical support. They help in tissue repair. They help in the take up of new certain neurotransmitters such as glutamate. They help the take up of potassium ions. And most, most importantly, they have a role in maintaining the blood-brain barrier, which we will look into more closer later on. Microglial cells are the immune cells of the nervous system and protects the system from invading pathogens such as bacteria or viruses. They are also important in the repair and rege re regeneration of the nervous system after an injury such as a brain injury. Lastly, we have the ependymal cells which are located in different areas in the brain like this, like here. Uh, they are cells that look something like this. They are small ciliated cuboidal epithelial cells which line the inner ventricles of the central nervous system. A very important function of the ependymal cells is the production of cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. So what is CSF? Well, it is for protecting the brain from shock, basically. Uh, the brain and the spinal cord actually have many layers of protection because it is such a delicate and important organ in the body. If we look at this skull, uh, with the top half slightly cut, revealing the brain, and zoom into this section up here, we see few layers of protection. First, we have the hair and skin, which is basic so that no invading pathogens or something can enter. The skull protects the brain from hard knocks to the head. And just below the skull are three important layers of uh, protection, made up of different types of tissues. They are from the top, dura mater, arachnoid matter, and pia matter. The other fundamental protective component of the brain is CSF, cerebrospinal fluid. CSF is a liquid where the brain basically floats in, and so when the head is hit, for example, or damaged from some form of trauma, the liquid will absorb the shock and not the brain. Lastly, there is also an internal protective system for the brain called the blood-brain barrier, which controls substances moving into the brain. It works by sealing the capillaries 
and only allowing certain molecules such as glucose to diffuse through to the brain. We will look into the blood-brain barrier a little more later on. But for now, let's talk about CSF. Cerebrospinal fluid is secreted by epidermal cells which are from a location called the choroid plexus. I would like to show where the choroid plexus are located in the brain, uh, the, in the central nervous system, as well as show the movement of CSF in the brain. So here we are cutting the brain and looking at it from a side view. So located somewhere here near the thalamus is the choroid plexus lateral ventricle and it secretes cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid moves in this direction as shown by the arrows. Just under the thalamus is, the, is another ventricle called the third ventricle which also secretes CSF. The CSF flows in this direction and mixes with other CSF secreted from the choroid plexus of, of the fourth ventricle which is located under the cerebellum. They move out through a small gap um, somewhere under the cerebellum and then proceeds to flow around the whole brain like so. Now once the CSF goes to the top of the brain, it will be absorbed by the arachnoid villi, uh, situated, remember, near the, basically in the arachnoid matter, to be recycled. So just recapping, the CSF is secreted by the choroid plexus, located in the lateral ventricle, the third ventricle, and the fourth ventricle, which are located here, here, and here. So now let's zoom into one of these ventricles to see how secretion takes place. Hey. So here is the blood vessel of the choroid plexus. And surrounding it are the ciliated cuboidal epidermal cells. Here. And now normal fluid contains no nutrients. Um, normal fluid containing no nutrients is absorbed into the choroid plexus and then it will get transformed by the epidermal cells to produce CSF. Now CSF contains lower amounts of proteins, uh, lo lower amounts of glucose than normal fluid. It also contains higher amounts of sodium, lower amounts of potassium, higher amounts of chloride and magnesium ions as well as high amounts of oxygen and vitamins, which are very, very important for the brain and helps with nourishment. Now, although the brain constitutes only 2% of the adult's whole body weight, it requires 15% of the blood in, from the body. This means that 85% of the blood goes to the rest of the body and 15% goes to the brain. Now, for such a small thing, it requires a lot of uh, nutrients. Now, the brain is the main control system, that's why, in the body, and so requires a lot of nourishment. 20% of oxygen and glucose consumed by the body is fed to the brain. But what if these substances being brought to the brain are potentially harmful, especially if they travel via blood vessels? <clears throat> well, the brain has a pr protective barrier, which only allows necessary molecules to pass through. This is known as a blood-brain barrier. A typical cap capillary looks something like this, where where the cells surrounding the vessels are easily are, are permeable to other substances, and so substances can move out easy, quite easily. Brain capillaries, however, are tightly sealed and also contain the neuroglial astrocytes mentioned at the beginning of this video, which covers and coats the vessel, so no foreign material or unnecessary mo molecules can pass through. The blood-brain barrier is there to avoid large changes in concentration of sodium, potassium, and calcium, as well as changes in, in osmolality in the brain, and to avoid harmful substances as well as hormones to come inside. The brain itself does not store food, so its food supply. Glucose has to be transported to it regularly. Glucose is the only source of nourishment for the brain, as well as vitamins. However, if glucose is deprived, such as if one is stranded in the desert or the sea, another source of fuel is required. This, these are, this is where ketone bodies come in, which are essentially lipid-derived food, which was converted by the body in order to feed the brain. That was it for the first part. There are many parts more to go. I hope that was okay. Thank you.